this video was originally recorded March 2017 at Tibet House U.S. in New York City. Tune in as Sharon Salzberg returns to Tibet House this September with Professor Thurman and Dr. Mark Epstein. To learn more, please visit TibetHouse.us. Uh, good morning. So I, I believe they're still out there. I didn't actually look when I came in, but last night I left um, some postcards on the desk right near the bookstore, um, which are free. Somebody had them made um, for me. I don't know if anyone still uses postcards, but they're actually <laughs> postcards. You can send it to someone in the mail, and it's just got some nice graphic and a nifty saying on it. Um, and also I left flyers from, for a retreat I'm doing in early March uh, at the Garrison Institute. Uh, the title of the retreat is People Who Care for People. So if you're in any kind of relationship, personal or professional, we feel you are in that role. So it's a lot about the difference between empathy and compassion, compassion and burnout, some of which we're going to cover today. And I'm teaching that with three really tremendously wonderful guys from Baltimore. Um, and there's a really uh, meaningful amount of scholarship money available for that and more coming um, soon. So uh, check it out. So I think that's all still up there. How many of you were not here last night? OK. I get to repeat myself so lot. Um, well, we have a day, which is fabulous and uh, really very luxurious and, and great. Thank you for spending your Saturday with me here. Um, uh, we'll take a lunch break. Usually what we do is, uh, given that several people have to go out and get food, and that can be a little slow, uh, if we say an hour for lunch, we'll start with a half hour meditation after. So as Bob Thurman always says, if you have a slow waiter or waitress, you don't have to get all angry and frustrated and freak out and come back all stressed out. You know, so whatever amount of time we set for lunch, we'll add theoretically that. And those of you who can get back or you brought your lunch or you don't want to have lunch, um, you know, we'll, we'll start with a half hour sitting, okay? And we'll close by five. So the topic is equanimity, uh, balance, peace, perspective. When you call it those things, it sounds a little better. I think then equanimity, and we're gonna to spend today also exploring the difference between reacting to something and responding to something, the difference between um, being balanced and being indifferent, and also, as I said, some of the difference between, I think you might have to turn me up a little bit since the window's open, um, and the difference between things like compassion and when compassion becomes overwhelm. And it's equanimity that really makes that difference for us. So it's a deepening understanding of equanimity and bringing that in that, that really allows us to have a much steadier, more steadfast kind of compassion. And even if we do burn out, we know how to come back, right? So uh, why don't we start with the sitting? We're gonna do both mindfulness practice and loving kindness practice today, but we can begin just with that kind of fundamental exercise in arriving, coming back to the moment, being more present. See if you can sit comfortably with your back straight, but not like strained. As I said last night, there's some balance exhibited right away in our posture. 
because you want energy in your body, but not like so much energy, you're really uptight. You also want to be relaxed and at ease, but not like so relaxed that your way slumped over. So you feel your way into what feels like a balanced posture for you. And you can close your eyes or not. If you start with your eyes closed and you get really sleepy, it's fine to open your eyes and continue on. If you like, you can begin with listening to sound. Just letting the sounds wash through you. and bring your attention into feeling your body. And then the breath, just the normal natural breath, wherever it's strongest or clearest for you, nostrils, chest, or abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there and rest. If you like, you can use a quiet mental notation like in, out, to help support the awareness of the breath, but very, very quiet. So your attention's really going to feeling the breath, one breath at a time. And you find your attention has slipped off, you've gotten lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. The moment of recovery, the moment of recognition, oh, I've been gone. Being able to gently let go and shepherd your attention back to the feeling of the breath, that's more important. So you realize you've been gone, See if you can let go without judgment, without feeling like a failure, and simply return to begin again.
So if anyone would like a chair, those of you who came in a little late, there seem to be plenty of them, and there are more that can be <coughs> brought out. Is that spot free? There's also a cushion right in front here. Hello. Hi. That's all right. Okay, so um, just to repeat a little bit briefly from last night, um, the word equanimity actually means balance. We can mistakenly take it for indifference, coldness, <laughs> uh, withdrawal, numbness. Um, all kinds, apathy, <laughs> there are all kinds of things, all kinds of words that go on that list. But it doesn't actually mean any of those things. It means balance. So that is in the context of mindfulness or awareness practice, that means the balance that leads to wisdom. It's developing a relationship with all of our experience, internal and external, such that there can be some very profound learning that happens because we're not, let's say a certain emotion comes up, we're not immediately up in arms trying to get rid of it or ashamed of it or something like that. That allows the space to see more clearly into it and that's true with anything. And in the context of qualities of the heart like loving kindness or compassion, Equanimity means the balance that's born from wisdom. So it implies applying our, our insight, our understanding, our perspective to a situation where we're trying to help or we're reaching out, something like that, where uh, loving kindness and compassion are very active and yet it's very easy to burn out. It's very easy for that offering to become very conditional, like get better, would you? Um, things like that. So uh, the role of equanimity in that context is, is to bring wisdom, the voice of wisdom, into that kind of situation. Okay, so uh, it's very difficult. I think it is an awkward word. It's easy to confuse it with balance. It's easy to think, for example, if you had equanimity, uh, you couldn't say anything with any intensity. You have to be sort of extremely laid back in your mannerisms and, and so on. It's also easy, and many people have been in this situation, uh, for someone else to insist on like high drama as a sign of caring. Um, whereas, you know, we would say, we can know from within, are we actually withdrawing or are we really present and open, but not in a super reactive way. So there are lots of fine differences to be explored in this. And just like I was saying with compassion, um, even if our compassion leads to burnout, we learn how to come back. So too, if, if we have equanimity and it's falling off into indifference and that kind of sullenness, like, I don't care, uh, or whatever, that's the best phrase ever to describe that, whatever, um, we know how to come back. We learn how to come back to a state that's more genuinely the, the voice of, of wisdom. So I'll start with um, just a, a depiction of the world, I'm sure it's very familiar to many of you, um, just as the Buddha saw it, very simply put, that 
our moment-to-moment -moment experience consists of these six sense doors and contact with sense objects. So it's seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. And then there is what is called in the Buddhist psychology a sixth sense, which is not something paranormal. It just means knowing through the mind. Ideas, thoughts, concepts, images, you could say emotions, which is, you know, sort of involves a lot of, of different modalities. So we know through seeing, we know through hearing, we, you know, things like that. We have those five plus knowing through the mind. And it said that in every moment of one of those contacts, points of contact through seeing a visual object, hearing a sound and so on, there's a feeling tone that's associated with that for us of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutrality. Now the feeling tone, and that's also confusing sometimes, that is translated as sensation, but sensation is really of the body. Sometimes it's translated as feeling, but it doesn't mean emotion. It means that particular quality of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutrality that is associated for us with every moment of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, and thinking. And that means everything, right? Because that's how we know the world. That's, that's one way of talking about our lives. So um, the feeling tone is not irretrievably, inevitably tied to a certain experience. There are all kinds of reasons why, say, we might find someone's comment funny one day and annoying another day, right? Uh, or maybe the example I usually use is we have this sharp shooting pain moving down our arm and almost any day that would be felt by us to be unpleasant, but maybe our arms have been completely numb for six months and that sharp shooting pain is like it's coming back to life and it's actually kind of pleasant for us. So there's layers of interpretation and belief and uh, all kinds of meaning we might ascribe to a certain experience. So, but even that, you know, sometimes we work on looking at those interpretations like, um, you know, why is it that uh, we find unpleasant every breeze? That's, that points to some heavy conditioning, you know? So, uh, and it's interesting and fruitful to look at that, but bless you, most of the work of mindfulness doesn't happen there. Most of the work of mindfulness happens after we have experienced something as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. You know, that's not to say that other work is useless by any means. It really can be tremendously fruitful and interesting, but if you're talking about just practice in a kind of strict sense of the word, sometimes that happens so fast and it would be like endless, you know, to sort of try to figure out why are those breezes, so, right? So, We've already experienced something as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That's the place where mindfulness plays a really, really big role. Because we tend to have distorted relationships with each of those feeling tones. So the question comes up, how do we relate to pleasure? Oddly enough, that's not always that easy, right? Sometimes pleasant things are happening, really joyous, lovely things, and we are so distracted, we don't even take them in. We don't even really feel in touch with them. Sometimes really pleasant things are happening, but we have some fixed idea of what should be happening, and so it's not good enough and we're somehow disparaging or dissatisfied. And the story I often, often tell about this is um, 
I go to Washington, D.C. Uh, often to teach. And one year I was there during cherry blossom season when that kind of concentrated area of cherry trees were all in bloom. But I was so busy that year I could only get there at night, um, which was still a lovely experience. And then the following year, a friend had heard that I'd only gotten there at night the year before, so she was determined I was going to get there during the day. And we managed it. We did it. So we got there, and I just thought it was so beautiful. It was so lovely, all those delicate pink blossoms. And I was really just in awe. And then my friend said, oh, no, it's past the peak. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, it's past the peak. I'm having a bad experience. <laughs> this isn't good enough, right? So that happens quite a lot. That's an interesting thing to look at. And sometimes we have maybe even a strong conditioning around not deserving pleasure. So as soon as it happens, we're kind of distorting it or deferring it. I was just in Miami um, last weekend teaching. Um, sometimes, of course, when you leave New York City to go to a place like that in the winter, you're leaving like, you know, zero degrees. And then it's almost embarrassing. So I was down there and people were saying, oh, aren't you glad to get away from the winter, and it was actually colder there than it was here. <laughs> and I was sort of relieved. I could say, you know, I, I came off the, the plane, I was wearing boots, and I had, you know, my jacket, you know, because you never know when you come back. And uh, actually, they were useful. It was, it was really funny. Uh, then it warmed up, and then I could feel, oh, no, I'm going back to winter. Uh, how will I ever explain this to anybody? Um, but there's so many ways in which we kind of it's not really that good. Um, we're embarrassed. There's a lot of suffering in this world. Uh, we don't necessarily see pleasure as giving us strength and resourcefulness to look at our own other suffering. Um, you know, so we might just really kind of hold it off. And of course, we have the classic relationship of clinging. As soon as something pleasant happens, perhaps we have the habit of grabbing it, holding it, wanting to own it. I can't bear the thought of this ever changing. Um, how am I going to keep this forever? How am I going to make sure this never, ever changes? So the Buddha said it really, bless you, cogently, um, in a very homey sort of way. He said, holding on tightly, to that which must inevitably change is like holding on tightly to a revolving wheel. At some point or another in the cycle, you are bound to get run over. So the idea isn't to never experience pleasure, because life is just a succession of moments, right? Pleasant, painful, neutral. And it's not to numb out, and it's not to enter this sort of gray state, which I hear not infrequently people say, well, I must be doing something wrong because it's not all neutral. You know, it's not all this just kind of dull gray experience. But that, of course, is not the purpose of the practice. There's pleasure, there's pain, there's neutrality. The big question is how do we relate to that so that we're not adding on some sort of distortion. We can actually experience pleasure as pleasure and take delight in it without these extra things. So that's kind of encapsulated in the word uh, craving, right, in some way. But it means all of that, all of those sort of funny ways of relating to pleasure. So holding on um, is another way it's sometimes described. So it could be holding on to an idea of what should be, all kinds of things like that, right? So we have pleasant experience. We have painful experience, certainly. Um, and we tend to have a lot of conditioning around 
experiencing pain. If it's our own personal pain, it just seems wrong. I think this is personal conditioning for many of us. It's cultural conditioning. Uh, I think it's a big, big American thing. Um, you know, there's such a premium on being in control at all times that if anything seems to have gone wrong, it implies having lost control. And that includes getting sick, getting older, even dying sometimes can seem like a personal humiliation. Like, should have been able to hold that off. Should stay young forever. Um, let alone if you're afraid, if you're, you know, you have psychological, emotional issues, whatever it might be, there tends to be a kind of conditioning so that feels more shameful than anything. And so that leads to a sense of isolation rather than feeling this is part of the human condition. You know, this is the kind of thing people go through. This is why the Buddha is saying their suffering in this world is such a massively liberating statement. Just that. Let alone there's something you can do about it, but even just that. So it's, it's work. I mean, it's really a process to refine a relationship to pain and suffering. And then when it's someone else's pain or suffering, I think we're often taught, well, let's just tuck them away somewhere. We don't want to look at that. That's displeasing. Uh, that, you know, that should really be somewhere else. Um, so we're caught in isolating ourselves, isolating others. And we have the possibility, instead of that, to actually experience pain in a more open-hearted and balanced way. To come to a place where you are applying tools like mindfulness and compassion to the seeing of pain does not mean things don't hurt. I think that's the other extreme. Um, and people often say from a kind of, kind of practice perspective or um, something, um, well, I know this shouldn't have been painful. And if I hadn't been resistant, it wouldn't have hurt. Or uh, as I wrote to somebody recently, people come and they say to me, I lost my job, my cat died, uh, my mother is sick, and my house burnt down. I don't know why I'm so upset. <laughs> you know, and you think, well, it's a lot. <laughs> you know? Um, and that, I think, feeds into that sort of mistaken notion that it's only our attitude that makes for that pain, that painful feeling feeds into, that doesn't, well, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, it's only our attitude that makes for that painful feeling, feeds into the cultural thing that nothing should hurt, right? That it, you're somehow at fault if, if things hurt. And I say something's just hurt. That doesn't mean we don't add extra suffering through our attitude and our spirit and how we greet it and our resistance and all that. Certainly we do. Or, can do or cannot do, but that initial feeling is just part of the way we experience the world. Something's really hurt, and it's a pretty unfair expectation on ourselves to think, well, it should be all bland, and you know, let me add to the list 15 more th terrible things that happened, but I really shouldn't be upset, you know. Um, so some things just hurt. And we can learn, oh, look at all those ways I exacerbate that, and look at that habit, and look at that tendency to blame myself, or feel bitter, or isolate further, or whatever it might be, or judge. Um, 
that do make things much worse. So my favorite example of this, uh, which I used here the other night, not last night, but earlier, um, uh, my friend, my colleague Sylvia Borstein, told this story when we were teaching together uh, at the Garrison Institute. And it's a story about her uh, then nine-year-old granddaughter, Honor. So I promised her if I ever told the story, I would say that. This is, that it's Honor and that she was nine years old. So they were preparing um, these dinner plates for Seder. And uh, so Sylvia said to Honor, I want you to take a teaspoonful of horseradish and put it on each piece of gefilte fish. And Honor said, I never realized before now that you could take a truly terrible thing and make it even worse. <laughs> <coughs> so Sylvia hastened to add, she said, I actually make really excellent gefilte fish. <laughs> And I added, I love horseradish. <laughs> I think of filter fish as a delivery system for horseradish. But nonetheless, <laughs> this was Honor's experience. So that's become my favorite example of how we can have something going on that we don't like, or it hurts, it's hurtful, it's painful, and we can make it a whole lot worse. <laughs> and can't we? Right? Um, if you just think about things. so. Uh, there's so many possibilities for how we respond. So I was in Ireland teaching, um, and somebody told me this great story. Um, he was talking about maybe like the year before, he and uh, a few friends had traveled to the States. And uh, they were on the last leg of their journey, and they were flying like from California to maybe Chicago and then on to a New York City airport. And then they were gonna catch a connecting flight back, bless you, back to Ireland. And all the stuff went awry and it was like really tough and um, they were incredibly late. So they landed at JFK after midnight. Uh, no chance of the connection and their luggage was lost. So, um, this woman came out of one of those doors to help them. And what this guy said was really priceless. He said, she looked worse than we did, <laughs> you know? And uh, he saw from her name tag that her name was Irene. So he said, I happen to have a traveling ukulele, right? So, he said, I happen to have a traveling ukulele. So I, he said, I looked at her and I thought, she looks like she hasn't been serenaded in a while, which as a friend told me, that could be said for a lot of us, you know. But she looks like she hasn't been serenaded for a while, so I picked up the ukulele and I started playing Good Night Irene, Good Night. And then all these doors opened and all these airline personnel or airport personnel started coming out and everyone was just like singing and you know, serenading her. And by the end, she was like beaming. And she said to them, I am the best person in this company at finding luggage. I am going to find your luggage. I'm going to find you a great connection. Right? So we don't all react to lost luggage that way. Right? In fact, that was Ireland. So maybe four days later, I was in France, and they lost my luggage. I neither had a traveling ukulele, nor was I quite as balanced, probably, as he. But, uh, there's so many ways we might respond to a, a difficult and even much more difficult than that kind of situation. That's where our work is, in, is in how we are holding it and responding it. To say this shouldn't be painful is like too much, okay? And then we have neutral experience. Those moments we don't find particularly pleasant or painful or you know, stimulating or exciting or whatever, those tend to be the more routine, repetitive, ordinary times. And that's where we tend to numb out. You know, rather than holding on or pushing away, we just fade. Um, sometimes that happens because we're bored. Sometimes it happens because 
we don't feel really alive unless there's intensity. For most of us, we're not awfully trained to subtlety, and we do count on a certain level of intensity in order to feel alive. We're a little bit sleepy in those times. When I was first learning um, a particular technique of meditation called mental noting, where we started a little bit of that with the breath when I said you can, if you like, repeat in out. Well, an extension of that is to apply a mental note to whatever your predominant experience is in any moment. So I was living in this compound in India and I realized that I was basically walking around and the single most common note I was making was that of waiting. I was just kind of saying, waiting, 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 waiting. And one day I said to myself, what are you waiting for? And I realized I was waiting for something like significant enough to happen or important enough to happen or spiritual enough to happen so I could note it. And I was basically living as though a tape recorder with the pause button on, right? So that's what happens often when things are just kind of neutral. We wait. So we're not really connecting very fully in the moment. So in, in terms of Buddhist psychology, we would call those, the root of those kinds of reactions, um, grasping aversion, delusion. Delusion in this context, meaning that sort of numbness or disconnection going on. And so there's the work. We have every opportunity to relate differently to pleasure, to actual ex actually experience it, but without adding all of that reactivity. We have every opportunity to relate differently to painful feeling without adding all the usual stuff. And we have every opportunity to wake up and actually connect to neutral feeling and be very alive in those moments, which is a good thing, because if you really look at your day, there tend to be an awful lot of neutral moments that you can't somehow make more exciting all the time. But we can be very different with it. So that's what mindfulness means, is relating differently in that moment, having felt the pleasure, pain, or neutrality of an experience. And equanimity is like that ingredient in mindfulness, which is the non-reactive aspect of it. So we're not immediately driven by old habits that say, hold on, push away, defer, go to sleep, whatever it is. It's balance. It's a balanced relationship to what is. And out of that balance, we can make choice. I want to keep this. I want to leave this, whatever it is. OK, so it will figure in every moment where we have the opportunity to maybe not add so much horseradish to the gefilte fish <laughs> if you don't like horseradish. It's really, it's tremendously empowering. So equanimity, again, it doesn't mean indifference or coldness or not caring. It's having like this balanced relationship to what is. And we'll talk much more about it. So why don't we take a short break? You can just get up and stretch, go to the bathroom, whatever. We'll come back, we'll do another sitting, and we'll continue on. Hello, hello, yeah. Um, so the garrison retreat got pushed a little bit into like December 10th-ish, whatever that, you know, thir so Thursday to a Sunday, so. And every year Sylvia says it's the last year she's gonna do it. And then it's so much fun we book another year, but someday the last year will actually happen. I had a really funny experience on the flight to Miami. Um, because I had Wi-Fi, and uh, so I was just doing email, and uh, 
one of the organizations I'm involved in, and there are many, sent this email, and um, I had some rather strong views about the issue at hand, so I wrote this kind of, wasn't angry, but it was very strong email and response. And then we hit like this enormous amount of turbulence. And <laughs> it's like going up and down and up and down. And I thought, what if that was the last email I ever sent? <laughs> I thought, I don't know how I feel about that as my very last email on this earth and then for this lifetime. And then I thought, and it's not even like a conversation where somebody might say, oh, well, that was just someone's interpretation of her <laughs> point of view. This is like a written record, <laughs> you know? And so then I resolved, okay, maybe you should treat every email as though it might be your last email. Um, just keep that, it is true, isn't it? Keep that in mind. I think she might give you the microphone because it's a little hard to repeat a comment. Okay. Like, so before I came to class, uh, I mean, before I came to see you last night, I was in class. I'm at new school, film school, and um, our teacher. We watch a lot of films. They're documentaries. Can you hear her? No. And is that better? Mm -hmm. And um, so we watch a lot of docs and critique them and so we watched something and afterwards she said what did you see and and I immediately launched into a critique well the music was romanticized and I even had that tone of voice and she said back up <laughs> she got me prepared for coming here it was great back up tell me what you saw just what you saw and and I was taken back and I realized how habituated I am to critiquing in that voice and with really not seeing it was so brilliant it was yeah, mindfulness at practice I loved it and it was just frame by frame by frame is it black and white grainy there was a man a girl you know what a lesson yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's what I meant by, I think you have to, might, maybe you have turned me up a little too. I'm not sure. I'm okay? Um, that's what I meant by saying when I stayed with a neuroscientist friend of mine, this woman named Amishi, down in Miami, and I was describing the process of communicating to this Burmese teacher, um, because everything has to go through a translator, and it's very formulaic. Um, but really, one of the great benefits of his insistence on you describing things in a certain way was that you really had to leave the realm of interpretation mm -hmm. and go to the realm of what you saw. And so that's what my, that's what Amishi called data, right? He said, I get that. You just want the data. And it's very intriguing to hear oneself and witness it in others. I had a terrible morning. Well, what does that mean? you know, what happened. And uh, in the world of meditation where we so often don't necessarily have the, all the information, because there's a body of knowledge, you know? And so uh, a very common thing as an example, speaking of balance, you know, um, a very common thing is for people to say, um, had a terrible morning. Well, what does that mean? Well, I couldn't concentrate at all. Um, but what was your actual experience? And then uh, there is an experience because as, as many of you know, um, there's a lot about meditation practice that is really working with balance so that we are deepening calm, tranquility, peace, relaxing at the same time we are strengthening energy interest alertness right it's both and the goal is to strengthen both and have them in a kind of balance but that's not always the case just in the course of time 
you may have one or the other side at a certain phase, be stronger. So when the calm, concentration, peaceful side of things is stronger than the energized, alert, interested side of things, then uh, we fall into a state that classically is known as sinking mind. I call it the ooze. <laughs> we just kind of ooze along and it's pretty peaceful, but it's not very sharp, right? And it's not a bad state, because part of that equation, part like the tranquil side is really happening, it's just out of balance. So what you need to do is pick up the energy. So that's why in something like mindfulness practice, uh, we say things like try mental noting. Don't just feel the breath, actually use a word, in, out, because that picks up your energy. Or do something even just mechanical, like open your eyes. Or uh, take a few deep breaths and then allow the breath to become natural. If you're doing loving kindness practice, which we're gonna do this afternoon, rather than resting our attention on the feeling of the breath, we rest our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases, like may I be happy, may you be happy, things like that. And uh, here too, we can fall into that sinking mind sort of state. But I find because it's verbal, we know what those phrases mean, um, we often pick up on that state sooner because uh, what tends to happen, bless you, is that the phrases get garbled. So um, I used to sometimes find myself in Burma where I first did this practice really intensively, repeating, you know, may you be filled with suffering, may you be fun. I'd go, no, may you be free of suffering, right? Um, but once I found myself repeating, may I fall asleep. <laughs> Right, so, so that streamy, sluggish kind of state might not be a sign you have no concentration. It might be a sign you have more concentration than you have energy, but people always come in and say, oh, I couldn't concentrate. Right, that's why you need the data to actually find out, okay, oh, this was your experience, then, you know, that, may not be calling for more tranquility, more calm. That might be calling for get up and do walking meditation or something like that. So uh, it's, it's a really powerful exercise for oneself, even if you're not describing something to someone else to see if you can come back to, oh, this is what the experience actually, actually is. So, okay, is there anybody else before we go on? Although now the microphone's disappeared. Anybody? Okay, shouldn't bring you the microphone? Thank you so much. We kind of left on a question of does this work? The last question that was asked regarded patience, and I just wanted to see if there was a connection between patience and loving kindness. And what came to mind when you asked that question? Um, was um, I have a, a son who um, has developmental de delays and he has a, a tremendous amount of energetic joy and it's just fabulous. It's like he's my little Buddha, you know. However, he has, um, I, he, a part of his neurological issues uh, are repeating things in a very energetic, joyful way a thousand times a day and sometimes I just tune it out I cannot deal with it and other times I just listen over and over and, and he makes me repeat what he's saying too and I was thinking okay that's a very extreme example but there's other things like maybe your partner has a habit that's just not gonna break no matter how many times you've tried to address it or have that person change that habit. So there's, it's, it's, I mean, I think everybody has some of that. And how do you, um, I mean, how can you meditate about handling that? And is that part of the loving kindness? Um, I think it is part of the loving kindness and it's even more 
part of like a combination of equanimity and loving kindness, which of course we'll, we'll talk about. And equanimity, um, remember, does not mean indifference or pulling back or, or not caring. It's more a kind of spacious environment, uh, which you really want to have accompany your loving kindness. Um, so it's almost like the patience is, is said to be more a function of equanimity. And it said equanimity will endow loving kindness with patience. Otherwise, just out of sheer, you know, longing for someone to be happy um, or change their ways according to our view of how they should be uh, or the timetable we want for them. Uh, it's easy for loving kindness to become what one of my friends once called loving kindness with an edge, like maybe happy by Thursday, <laughs> you know, and uh, hurry up, I've got a long list of people to make happy. <laughs> and speaking of lists, here's your list of all the things you need to improve in order to be happy according to my, you know, and it's very easy for loving kindness to become, remember it's a practice of generosity. Loving kindness is like generosity of the spirit, like may be happy, may be peaceful. And we know that any act of generosity can be like a freely given gift or it can be very complicated. Um, thank me, thank me louder, put my name up, tell me it's the best book you've ever gotten in your life. Um, give me that in exchange, whatever. And so it's very easy for that to happen. It will happen, but we can come back, you know, to a, a more free state in the, in the giving. So um, it's really equanimity that gives us that kind of big arena to, to have loving kindness in. And well, you know, we're about to launch into loving kindness, so. Anybody else before we? Thank you. This morning, I think that I heard in your response to the gentleman in front of me an opportunity for self-compassion, maybe. Um, I have two coworkers, both of whom are subordinates, one who's considerably older than me and one of whom's considerably younger. The younger one has self-esteem issues, and I care deeply for both of them, and so I was having a conversation about the younger one with the older one. And I said, um, it was sort of like a, a eureka moment. I said, um, I would like to help him but I cannot walk his path for him. Uh, he has to do that on his own. And so there's an element of patience involved. And the fact that I know that I can only do so much for him doesn't mean that I care less. So the self-compassion angle might be realistic expectations. So you would like to save the whole world, but expecting more from yourself mm -hmm. than it's possible to give seems yeah. like a trap in a way. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Almost the definition of equanimity is exactly what you said. Um, there are these four qualities that are normally taught together, so I'm going to go through them, uh, which I did last night as well, but I'll obviously do it more extensively today. Um, the first is loving kindness. The second is compassion. The third is sympathetic joy, or having joy in the happiness of others. And the last is equanimity. And each of them can be developed in terms of meditation through its own distinct method. Or more commonly, uh, we take one vehicle like loving kindness and we do all four through that one vehicle. So if you are doing equanimity on its own, um, it's the repetition of certain phrases, bringing our attention back when our minds have wandered. And thinking of different beings we have different relationships with. So somebody we feel close to, someone we hardly know, and, and so it's the repetition of those phrases in relationship. 
And the phrases are almost exactly what you just said. Um, the classical way it's phrased is not something everybody likes because it uses the word karma. And that's so hard to understand. It can sound a lot like victim blaming, which it's not meant to be, but it's really meant to be exactly what you said. So the phrase classically, if you're choosing to do that particular practice is all beings are the owners of their karma. Their happiness and unhappiness depends upon their actions, not upon my wishes for them. So again, it takes a very exquisite understanding. Doesn't mean you're cold or uncaring. It means you realize there are limits to what I can do. I cannot get into your head. Thus far, no one has made the chip that we can implant in someone else and say, oh, behave better. You know, make better choices. Um, don't do that, do this, right? And so there is a limit to what we can do, even, which doesn't take away from our love, and effort, it actually sustains it. So because a lot of people don't like the word karma, it's so easy to misunderstand. Very commonly, if you are pursuing that as its own methodology, it'll be more like what you said. The idea is not to be cold, but to understand like, it's just not gonna happen that you can get in someone's head and make them all happy you know, uh, according to your lights of what they need to do. It's not gonna happen that you're gonna be able to change the entire world according to your wish. That doesn't mean you do nothing. It actually encourages what you can do. Because um, there's also this element of not knowing. That's part of equanimity is that we think what we see in front of us is the end of the story and it may not be the end of the story. It so likely isn't. Um, what we see in front of us is what's in front of us. And we can have a sense, even if we can't see the bigger picture, we can have a sense of a bigger picture. <clears throat> and this is the way in which um, I really am convinced, I'm very confident that we need to do the good that's in front of us because we don't know uh, where it will all go. And I'll you know, talk more about that in a minute too. But um, so it's some sensibility like that. That's exactly what equanimity is about. I will love you, I will care for you, and. Would that the universe was designed differently? And I could just sort of like use a remote control. Um, I like to think it would be a much better world. It would be terrible if it was worse, you know, or the same. But I like to think if I was in charge of everything. It would, it would be a lot better. Um, and I might be right, but it ain't gonna happen. So, it's a great example. Yes, uh, someone's gonna give you the microphone. Huh? Can I repeat the phrase? The, equanimity, the classical equanimity phrase? The classic, I got it. The classical equanimity phrase is all beings are the owners of their karma their happiness and unhappiness depends upon their actions, not upon my wishes for them. So this is usually done, it's done in conjunction with something like compassion, because um, they balance each other out. Uh, and I think it's, it's so hard to understand, it's only through experience that you kind of get a sense of how equanimity can really help you keep going, actually. Isn't it, you need the microphone. I just wanted to say that um, I'm a little bit suspicious of happiness. I'm not exactly yeah. sure why that is. But I can tell you that in my own life, things that I definitely needed to learn are often accompanied by or preceded by discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so the phrase that I'm more comfortable with yeah. is, may all beings find their way safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's going to be some storm clouds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine, and it's a good introduction to, um, you know, we'll take you a question in a minute, um, to the phrases. You know, uh, a lot of people have some objection to the word happiness, and so practically speaking, it's better to change the phrase, you know, rather than struggle. I also think, um, 
that happiness in the deepest sense does not mean just the experience of pleasure. It shouldn't, I mean it couldn't, because then we wouldn't be happy much of the time, you know? And then we would cling to the pleasure as though that were our only source of happiness. Um, but I know many people, I mean I have had uh, one book with happiness in the subtitle, it was Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness, and two books, you know, Real Happiness and Real Happiness at Work. So I've toured the country proclaiming the joys of happiness. And I know that it's not easy. For many people that word implies just the endless pursuit of pleasure, um, something superficial, something uh, conflict avoidant, trying to disdain pain or, or leaving it aside, which could never happen anyway. Um, when I was on tour for Real Happiness, uh, many people would come up to me and say, didn't you ever see the uh, bumper sticker that says, if you're not depressed, you're not paying attention? <laughs> and I'd say, well, yeah, I have seen it. And not only that, people in the last city brought it up. And, <laughs> and I understand it, you know, because we are so phobic, I think, as a nation about suffering and vulnerability and, and so on. I do understand it, but what about when you are depressed? and you're overcome by the suffering and you feel shattered and you're exhausted and you're fatigued. There's not a lot of wherewithal inside of you to try to help someone else or even pay much attention to someone else, right? So we need some sense of inner resource in hard times, in good times, whatever it might be, so that we can stay connected. And so I more use the word happiness in reference to that kind of inner resource. Um, you know, so it's both levels. It's like the word doesn't have to mean just the conventional meaning, but if it's not working for you as, as the method, you know, absolutely change the phrase, you know, so that it's more suited to you. Sometimes in a situation like this, you know, we don't have that long together, and I, I sometimes make what I think is a mistake of saying, you know, find three or four phrases that work for you, which can take all day, <laughs> you know? So uh, I think it would be better if you're not accustomed to this practice, if you're not already settled on some phrases, to at least experiment with the phrases I suggest, because it's just the form, and it's getting some familiarity with the form, and then you can decide, you know, those don't work for me, or, or whatever. I need you to use the microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have uh, just a question about what we were, you were just... And you need to hold it up. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hate this. Um, I, I, people do. Isn't that interesting? What? So, pe most people don't like using a microphone. I find it's interesting. Yeah, I guess... I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, I had in another um, practice with... You know, had the exor an exercise of writing down, I don't remember if it was 10 things in the course of the day that, that brought me joy or 10 things that made me happy. And, um, and it, was, I, I, it was a great exercise because I, I, no, I took note of, I noticed, I, and I was, I would stop and I paid attention. And it didn't seem, they, it wasn't things like, um, oh, I found a dollar on the street. It wasn't, it was like, walking out my door and feeling, oh, it's cold, but it's crisp, and it's not damp, and, you know, where, oh, my cat's in the cutest position, uh, you know, and that, I know that's not an inner resource. I was very depressed at the time, <laughs> I want to say, and I have reg clinical depression. Uh, it, you know, that's, there's something between that deep and the very superficial, like, more chocolate cake, <laughs> you know? Um, I just, is that right? I mean, yeah, not well, right, but there, there's, I don't that's think, important I, I don't think that's, I think the kind of joy, the noticing that you are describing is part of what gives us a sense of inner resource. Okay. You know, because mm -hmm. it's very easy to feel deprived and depleted and we don't have enough and we are not enough. And um, 
So actually making note of the joy, because it's so different from how we might normally be conditioned, is an excellent exercise to do. And it will help nourish that sense of an inner resource. So it's great. Um, it, it also reminds me of, uh, there's a, some of you probably know this, you understand this much more than I do, there's a current psychological uh, term that's being used more and more called savoring, right? Which is, are you excited about that? You're looking yeah, around. I mentioned it yeah. <laughs> Savoring, so yeah, lunch is a good time to mention it. Um, which, as far as I understand it, uh, to make the biggest impact in terms of um, neuroplasticity, actually changing your brain. So to have that kind of effect on your body-mind complex, you can't just kind of Oh, that's a nice photo. You have to like take a moment and go like, wow, look at that. And that it's actually that moment of savoring that has the rewiring effect. Uh, for a certain amount of time. For a certain amount of time. I don't know the length. What's the time? 12 seconds. 12 seconds. Thank you. OK, so that's not that long to ask of ourselves <laughs> to savor something. 12 seconds. I think we can do that, right? Let's see. Wow. Well, that's not short. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, it's like, it's like, wow, look at that. That's kind of incredible. Or how lucky is that? Or I get to enjoy this. Or um, I just find that interesting, too. And so uh, some people have an objection to the word happiness, um, not only because it's seen as superficial, but it can be seen as selfish. And this, I think, also feeds into a much deeper understanding of loving kindness practice, because um, if you think of happiness more as that sense of inner resource, savoring something, building that inner resource, taking the time, um, not only fixating on what's wrong, not ignoring what's wrong, but not only fixating on it, but take, making the effort to take in what we have to be grateful for, what's good, or the good within <laughs> us, bless you, or, or uh, the fact that we live in a world of change. That's not all bleak, you know? That's also kind of good, that there's renewal, there's movement, there's opportunity, there's doors opening. Um, having that kind of bigger picture, which builds this sense of inner resource, is not a selfish thing. Because nobody can just go on and on and on and on. It's just not realistic. And so, um, you know that now extremely common and kind of cliched um, description of the, I mean, it's the perfect example, which is why people use it all the time. If you're on a flight and the flight attendant is making the safety announcements and they say if the cabin pressure drops and the oxygen masks descend, put your own mask on first before you seek to help anyone else. Well, there's a time when um, I couldn't bring myself to say it. I mean, I'd heard it's not just on airplanes, but you know, listening to other people teach or reading people's writings, I felt like I'd heard it so many times. And I was talking to a writer friend of mine, and I said, I can't, I can't even use it. It's like such a cliche. It just, I can't bring myself to use it. And then she said. She had just been on an airplane, and they made that announcement. And the person, the woman in the seat next to her said, I could never do that. I could never put my own oxygen mask on first. And then I said, oh, maybe I can use it. <laughs> you know, like, it's still like provocative and meaningful and a challenge. Look at that, you know? 
But really, I mean, it makes sense, but it's hard. It's hard to allow that for ourselves. And so those things are good, you know, that kind of opening and, and so on. So the, the overriding framework, um, as I, you know, I spoke about last night, of this kind of approach to practice is these four qualities that are normally taught together. Um, as a collective, as a bundle, they're called the four Brahma Viharas. Brahma meaning celestial or supreme, or <coughs> as I heard one translation once, the word best. Vihara meaning dwelling or abiding or home. So taken together, these four qualities are said to form our best home. And they are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy or joy in the happiness of others, and equanimity. So in this context, equanimity means the balance that's born from wisdom. It means like perspective taking. It's interjecting wisdom into some situation where say we're actively practicing compassion or we're trying to make a difference. So equanimity becomes like the space within which we are, we are acting. Loving kindness um, is the common phrase for um, the word in Pali is metta, M-E-T-T-A, and if you ever come to the Insight Meditation Society or the Hindsight Meditation <laughs> Society, whatever it's called, uh, or you see our literature, there's maybe some around here somewhere. Um, it's a large brick building with white pillars and has this word up above, metta. So we moved in in February 14, 1976. Uh, it was a Catholic novitiate. It was run by the Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament. And that's what it's set up above the doorway. So um, we got someone to get up on a very tall ladder and said to them, can you please rearrange the letters so it says something about us, about who we are. So they got up on the ladder and they came up with metta, which is usually translated as loving kindness. And what followed was this very intense debate because um, in establishing the center, we actually had no models. It was the first center uh, started by Westerners in the West that was not like referring back to a singular Asian teacher or monastery. So we were trying to create a form in this country that was connected to where we come from and at the same time our own, you know, uh, in terms of the West. So that meant we had to discuss everything, like everything. As I sometimes tell people, we had this big discussion um, which we phrased, should we have Buddhas in public places? Uh, which is sort of an odd turn of phrase, but all of us, uh, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein and I had practiced with teachers who really emphasized this is not about becoming a Buddhist, in no way, you know? Uh, my first teacher, Goenka, the first night of my first retreat in 1971, started by saying the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. The Buddha taught a way of life. This in no way is about becoming a Buddhist or rejecting anything else. This is about the power of your own awareness. So that was like the ground out of which we'd all come. And at the same time, there's, there's a history, you know, there was a teacher who was the Buddha 2,600 years ago. Um, there's this vast, amazing body of knowledge born of his realization and his communication of that realization. So as I was, um, I was teaching loving kindness uh, a few years ago somewhere, and somebody said to me, wow, this is such incredible stuff. When did you make it up? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I didn't make it up, you know, and you're lucky I didn't make it up. <laughs> you know, so to have Buddha statues is a commentary on you are lucky these people didn't just make this up. 
<laughs> you know, so that was the argument for, and then there was the argument against, and, then, and we just went back and forth. And then uh, this U-Haul truck arrived one day, and it turned out that when Jack was in the Peace Corps in Thailand, he'd done a lot of shopping, and he had all these Buddha statues that were in his mother's attic in Maryland, and he just decided to bring them up. So all of a sudden we had Buddha statues and put them around, they're still there, you know, 40 years later. So we just had to discuss everything because we couldn't figure it out uh, easily. So that was the big debate. Should the word meta stay up there on the front of the building? It's not English, we're not in Asia anymore, nobody knows what it means, why should we have a word nobody knows what it means? Um, and finally, the point of view, at least thus far, uh, that wanted it to stay up prevailed, and I was very happy because that was my point of view. So I just like it when somebody like calls for directions and whoever answers the phone can say it's a large brick building with white pillars, and it's got this word up above, meta. And then they usually say, what does that mean? And we say that means love, or that means loving kindness, which I think is a beautiful representation of ourselves to the world. So loving kindness can be an awkward term. By the time I finish, I'm gonna be writing haiku, I think. <laughs> I'm losing words all the time. Um, or else volumes and volumes and volumes, trying to explain every word. Um, it most, to me, it, it really means connection. Because loving kindness doesn't mean you approve of somebody necessarily at all, or you like them, or you're gonna invite them home with you. It means there's a heartfelt sense of connection, which isn't always pleasant, you know, but it's kind of the truth that our lives are intertwined, that all of our lives have something to do with one another, no one left out, that we live as part of this network. Um, and the kind of constructs we usually live in a very rigid sense of self and other and us and them. They're just constructs, they're manufactured and they don't represent reality and they're very destructive because of that. So the sense of loving kindness isn't like necessarily emotional, you know, it's not like you want to embrace everybody. And, uh, but deep within you know that no one can be discounted or just dismissed. Our lives all have something to do with one another. So it's a practice of inclusion, of recognition. Classically, when we do that practice, we start with the offering of loving kindness to ourselves for this very reason that we're kind of capacity building, we're building this resource. Um, and then we move on to a benefactor. This isn't like within one session, this is over a, a period of time. We move on to a benefactor, that's someone who's helped us. Maybe they've helped us directly, a mentor, teacher, friend, parent. Or maybe we've never met them, they've inspired us from afar. Then we move on to a friend, someone we feel comfortable with, at ease with. We move on to a neutral person. That's someone we neither strongly like nor dislike. And often for us in these days, it would be somebody who plays a certain function, fulfills a certain function in our lives, like the shopkeeper of the place you usually go into or dry cleaner, somebody like that. Because it's very interesting to see what happens over time if you continue offering them loving kindness, the next time you go into that store or something like that. We then move on to a difficult person, someone with whom, and it's meant to be a mildly difficult person in the beginning, not just like the most unthinkable person, um, but somebody with whom you have a little bit of conflict or uh, dis-ease with. And then, you know, slowly uh, it can get more intense. And the reason we do that slowly is also around balance. It's not easy to really understand what it means to have compassion for someone else and yourself at the same time. Or what it means to have compassion for someone and realize it's just wrong, I'm not gonna give in. 
or to have compassion for someone and think, I can't fix this at the same time, right? So it's not that you figure it all out, but there is a kind of embodied knowledge that happens over time as we keep strengthening that muscle, right? So that by the time you're then working with somebody like awesomely difficult, you've got that going. And then we move on to offering loving kindness to all beings everywhere. To, it's a very global kind of extension. Okay, so that's the overarching arc of that particular practice. It's recognizing connection. Compassion is like a flavor of that where uh, it's defined as the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's actually a movement of the heart. And it is a movement toward to see if we can be of help. And in the context of this discussion, I usually emphasize it's not a movement into to be overcome by, to be shattered by, because then you don't have the energy to hang in there, right? That's when we withdraw. It's way too much. We burn out. Um, years ago, uh, Joseph and I went to the Soviet Union to teach. We went several times. Um, and then Russia, when it became Russia. But this was the first time we went. And uh, it was illegal at the time to teach meditation. So we went as part of a tour group. And we even brought Joseph's mother as kind of cover <laughs> for us. So we were on this tour. And every afternoon, Joseph and I would like just disappear. And we'd go off with a translator to someone's living room. And we would teach. And the translator came with us to all these different places. So, And I was speaking a lot about compassion. And I, I just felt like there was this really funny feeling in the room. So. I finally sat down with the translator and I said, well, when I say compassion, what do you say? And they said, oh, it's like this terrible state, you know, like, where you just feel broken and like nearly destroyed by the suffering. And they said, it's like someone has taken a giant stake and driven it through your heart. <laughs> and I thought, well, no wonder I'm getting this really funny feeling in the room, you know? But we can be there, you know, we can kind of think, oh, that's compassion. But common sense tells us that's not effective <laughs> long term, right? Because all you want to do is go to bed. It's too despairing. It's too much. So we need something that is that sense of inner resource. And again, I don't want to imply we never go there. I mean, of course we go there, but we can also learn to come back. Right, instead of saying, oh, this is where I want to be, this is where I need to be. Right, with some kindness toward ourselves and others, we can say, okay, I need some resource building here or something like that. Um, so compassion is the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. Sympathetic joy is being able to look at someone else's happiness or good fortune and not getting lost in jealousy or envy, but actually being happy for someone else's happiness. And this can be very challenging for us, not for everybody. As I also said last night, some people just have this quality naturally, and I find that so amazing. Uh, something great happens for you and they're just so happy for you. But for most of us, it is actually a training because we have some big assumptions about life we need to challenge in order to get there. So those assumptions, happiness is a limited commodity in this world. The more someone else has, the less there's gonna be for me. Um, and as I said earlier, you have everything and you will forever and I I have nothing and I will forever so clearly the big problems with that several 
Uh, first is nothing is forever. The second is it is so unlikely I have absolutely nothing or that you have absolutely everything. And there's this very funny assumption it's kind of hard to put into words. Um, and it's sort of like that prize, that praise, that accolade was heading right toward me and you stole it. <laughs> and if you hadn't done that, it definitely would have come to me. It was only your intervention that kept it from coming to me. It's sort of like uh, many of you will not remember uh, this television show, The Millionaire. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So there used to be this television show where these guys were driving around in a car with a million dollar check to give it to somebody. So that's the feeling. It's like they had my address and they were coming right to my place, but you like kidnapped them. <laughs> and you got the million dollars and not me. So sometimes, of course, we are in direct competition with somebody. We are applying for the same job. We're applying for the same grant. If you get it, I don't. But a lot of times, it's not like that. But we feel exactly as though it were like that. You stole it from me. You kept me from getting it. And sometimes that is so illogical, but we feel it anyway. Right? So in order to cultivate or strengthen sympathetic joy, we end up challenging those assumptions. They come up, we see them, we feel them. And we get to see through them and start to dissolve them. And it is, it's such an enormous state of relief because all that resentment doesn't dim the light of what someone else is experiencing anyway. It's not like it works, you know, which we can then feel guilty about, I suppose, you know. But it doesn't even work. It just makes us miserable. So um, sympathetic joy is the third of these qualities. And the last is equanimity. So in this context, equanimity is the balance born from wisdom. It's perspective taking. It's remembering nothing is forever. It's remembering it is so unlikely I have nothing. Let's take a look at what I have. It's remembering I'm not in control of this universe. I will do everything I can and can't guarantee. It's like, remember loving kindness, Actually, the first three are all practices of generosity. They're practices of like generosity of the spirit. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. And like any gift, you cannot guarantee how it'll be received. You know, you might have a beautiful motive and you decide, oh, I'm going to like make this amazing cup of tea for somebody. And you really, you are well motivated and you're really sensitive and you think, wow, I'm going to buy this special tea and I'm going to like heat the cup and I'm going to, you know, make the water the perfect temperature and I'm going to get a beautiful cup and I'm going to present this cup of tea to this person. But maybe... Um, that very person, before they came into the room, checked their cell phone messages and found out they just won like $10 million in the lottery. It's like they could not care less about this cup of tea. <laughs> and they sort of nod and walk away. And so what happens? Usually what happens is we're devastated. We don't necessarily stop and think, maybe they've got something going on. Or I did the best I could, right? The invitation actually in Buddhist teaching is, if you're trying to decide the integrity of an action, look back at your motive. Where was I coming from? And look at the skillfulness of the execution. Are there things to learn, you know? Maybe I don't run up to somebody in the middle of their talking to someone else and hand them a cup of tea, right? Are there ways I might have said this that might be different? You know, we learn skills. We learn from our mistakes. We learn from feedback. But to think that we will manage to do something perfectly so that the response will always be 
that's the best cup of tea I've ever had in my life, is not going to happen. You can't really say to somebody, I want you to come into the room 10, 15, something's going to happen. <laughs> and before you come in, I don't want you to check your cell phone, check your email, have a conversation with anybody, or have a single thought in your head. I want you to come in as a completely blank slate. Because life's not like that, right? Uh, every moment in time is all these conditions coming together and coming apart. That's where we need equanimity. We offer. We actually don't know how it's going to be received. Now, I don't want to imply we don't care. Of course we care. We like to be thanked. We want somebody to say that's the best book I've ever read in my life. Um, I mean, we're human beings. That's a natural human response. But the question becomes, how much do we care? Are we going to define ourselves and our action completely in the one realm we can do nothing about, which is how someone reacts? There will never be a time when everybody, without exception, praises us for a certain thing. It's like, Life isn't like that. So I go back to those eight vicissitudes I talked about a little bit last night, which recognition of the vicissitudes is one of the main pieces of wisdom that gives rise to equanimity. Remember, equanimity is like the voice of wisdom. The eight vicissitudes are the fabric of life, according to the Buddha, and that is pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute. Everybody has pleasure and pain in their lives. Gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute. So it's important to understand this isn't counseling toward apathy, you know, like, oh, I don't care, you know. And it's also not saying we won't have a response as human beings will have a response. We like to be praised rather than to be blamed. But how deep does it go? And are we going to kind of configure our whole lives around something that's totally unreal, like only getting praise? So I like talking about praise and blame as, as the pair because um, it's so interesting to me that it's exactly the same action. You write something, you say something, you do something that brings forth praise from some people and blame from others. So it's the same motivation. It's the same level of sensitivity with which you do it or skill with which you do it. And people will have different reactions to it. So the story I usually tell is about when my first book, Loving Kindness, came out. Um, if any of you ever see the hardcover version, you know it took a very long time for me to write that book. So someone on the back, either Jack Cornfield or Stephen Levine said, we've waited a long time for this book. And the other one said, in this long awaited first book, <laughs> and uh, I think it was Joan Halifax who said something like, Sharon Salzberg has finally given us. <laughs> and I made the publisher take off the finally. I thought that's too much. But it took me a very long time to write that book. And my whole life, you know, from the time I was a child, I didn't want to be a writer and didn't really think I could do it. And it's about loving kindness. I've been teaching loving kindness med meditation for like 10 years by the time the book came out. Um, it took me a long time to write that book, and finally it was done. So for me, it was like a huge accomplishment. And I went to California soon after the book came out, and I was having lunch with somebody, and they said, oh, Sharon, you wrote that book in such a way, it's just like being with you. It's like sitting down and having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy. I thought, there's probably not a nicer thing you can say to a writer 
than that. You know, what a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I was so jazzed by that comment that that night I was having dinner with a whole other group of people and I brought up the comment. And someone at the dinner table said, well, that's not true. <laughs> she said, it doesn't sound anything like you. It's nothing like being with you. And I thought, okay. You can be ecstatic at lunch and depressed at dinner. Or you could take a moment and think, it's the same book, right? Written from whatever was motivating me at the time with whatever level of skill I could bring forth. And one person had one reaction, another person had another reaction. And I would never want to pretend I didn't notice the difference. And of course we notice, and we care. But how much do we care? Do we stop? Because not everybody loved it or found it authentic. Or can we, I mean, we do look back at our motive and think, where was I coming from? We do look at the level of skill we were putting forth, but we cannot count on only praise. It doesn't exist in this world. And this goes back to even this really cute story from the time of the Buddha, which I love, where um, they say this man came to the monastery one day to learn something of the Buddha's teaching, and the first monk he came upon was this monk who had taken a temporary vow of silence. So when he was asked to say something of what the Buddha taught, he was silent. And the man got furious and he stomped away. So the same man came back a second day, came upon another disciple of the Buddha's, who was someone who was quite renowned, not just for his meditation practice, but for his theoretical knowledge. So when he was asked, he went into a very long theoretical description. And the man got furious and he stomped away. So the same man came back a third day and he came upon another disciple of the Buddha, this man named Ananda, this monk named Ananda. And Ananda, having heard what happened on the first day and what happened on the second day, was careful to say something, but not too much. And the man got really angry. And he said something like, how dare you treat such profound matters so sketchily, and he stomped away. So this group of people went off to see the Buddha, and they said, oh, Lord Buddha, this is what happened on the first day. This is what happened on the second day. This is what happened on the third day. What do you have to say? And the Buddha said, there's always blame in this world. If you say nothing, some people will blame you. If you say a lot, some people will blame you. If you say just a little bit, some people will blame you. There's always blame in this world. So can you feel responding to that with equanimity rather than apathy and not caring and rather than being drawn in thinking, I can't write, it's so clear, right? So it's, it's a felt sense, it's an understanding, it's an experience. And we will go from one extreme to the other and kind of find our way back to more of that sense of balance. But that's what it's about. It doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you have no preferences. I mean, I think that's kind of unrealistic, you know. I would rather, actually, every single human being on Earth praise my book, <laughs> to be frank. Um, <laughs> but it's wisdom. Not going to happen that way. Is there something for me to learn? Maybe I could have said something better, but it just is not going to be that everybody on Earth is going to say, wow, that's the best book I ever read. So it gives you a kind of balance. That's how you can keep going. Not lost in the frustration and, and so on. So equanimity. You want to take a break? And we'll come back, yeah, why don't you ask that first, then we'll take a break. Um, where's the microphone? <coughs> no, no. Did you shut it off there? I just wanted to ask whether 
Um, I think all four of these things are very uh, tightly intertwined, and uh, I really responded to that story uh, in a number of ways that I won't go into because it's tiresome. But this, it seems to me, might be a place where mindfulness buys us the time to develop equanimity. Mm -hmm. So there were yeah. times in the past where I was very reactive, so I couldn't, I would be immediately on the blame train or not or whatever, but, and I, I have a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but being more mindful lets me take a closer look at what's really going on before I make a judgment and that allows me more yeah. equanimity. Yes. No, absolutely, I think that's true. And, uh, we will keep talking about equanimity as well as practicing loving kindness in conjunction with equanimity, but um, mindfulness will give us the time. It creates the space to actually remember what we, we do know, like there's always blame in this world, or I did the best I could, or maybe I need to just listen and not react, or uh, people often ask, like, what do you do with hostile energy coming towards you? Um, and the question isn't, of course it doesn't feel good. Uh, the question isn't making yourself act like it feels good, but how deeply does it enter? And does it fill us, you know, and really uh, become toxic within us? So here I have another uh, cute story from the Buddha, and then we will take a break. Um, where it said the Buddha was walking on this farmer's land sometime, you know, and he was doing something like the farmer thought he was trespassing or something. He did something that really angered the farmer. So the farmer came up and started screaming and yelling at him and cursing him. And the Buddha said, oh farmer, like what if you nicely prepare a package for somebody, a gift for somebody, and you go to hand it to them and they won't take it out of your hand. And the farmer said, well, I guess then it remains with me. And the Buddha said, just so, O farmer, I'm not accepting your gift <laughs> of cursing and reviling and screaming and abusing. It's gonna remain with you. So I actually, silently, in some situations, actually look at people and I think, Oh, farmer, <laughs> it's going to remain with you. This is very good for holidays and families and so on. <laughs> you know, like, of course it doesn't feel good, but do we have to, like, suck it in, you know, and, and get suffused with someone else's kind of toxic energy? We actually don't, but we need enough mindfulness to realize that we're about to do that. We're, we're really careening into someone else's energy and then... Um, I, I, I really do actually sometimes think, oh, farmer, <laughs> which is enough. I have shorthand now, you know. Uh, you don't want to do that out loud. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are just things like that that we can actually employ when we have the space. So, okay, let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll practice. We'll keep talking. So we're going to sit and do some loving kindness um, and then we're just going to keep talking and have a discussion about all kinds of things. Burnouts already come up and uh, someone remind me, I told, I told you I'd tell you a story about hindsight. Um, so. Uh, the practice of loving kindness, as I said, is often the vehicle for all four of those qualities. We say equanimity is always there, otherwise loving kindness isn't loving kindness. It becomes more that kind of pressured thing, like get happy already, would you? Um, so equanimity is like a given. It's like saying wisdom is always there, otherwise it's not the full flowering that it could be of the state. It might be 
become a compassion exercise depending on the recipient. Maybe you choose someone who, a friend of yours who's not doing very well right now, becomes a compassion meditation. Maybe you choose a friend who is doing quite well, at least in some arena of life, becomes a sympathetic joy meditation. So even if you're using the same phrases, it can be emphasizing one of those other qualities. So while there is an arc over time to the practice, in any one session, it's like way too much. So usually we say the basic bookends of loving kindness is to start with offering loving kindness to yourself and with all beings everywhere. And what you do in the middle portion might change all the time. Maybe there is a friend of yours who's getting an award today, so you want to be sure to include them. Maybe as you're a neutral person, you're using your dry cleaner and you're going to the dry cleaners later today. You want to be sure to include them. <laughs> Whatever it might be, that middle portion is where you might, and you can't have everybody, you know, it's way too much. So um, those are the basic bookends. The practice is done not by resting your attention on the feeling of the breath, but by resting your attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases. The phrases are the way we are paying attention differently. So if, for example, you're the kind of person who thinks about yourself at the end of the day, and you pretty well only remember the mistakes you've made and what you could have done better, let's just say, the phrases are kind of expanding you beyond that limited view of yourself. You're just repeating, may I be happy, may I be peaceful, something like that. If you're the kind of person who usually goes to the dry cleaner and you look right through that person, like they are a piece of furniture, by holding them in your mind and thinking, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, you're shifting the whole basis of the relationship. This isn't the same as trying to force yourself to have a certain feeling or make believe anything or try to manufacture anything. You're resting your attention on the phrases in order to pay attention differently. And whatever happens will happen out of that, right? So the power of the practice is gathering all of your attention behind one phrase at a time. And the skill set is exactly the same as with the breath. It's not going to be 9,000 phrases before your mind wanders. Maybe it'll be three, maybe it'll be eight, you know? It's not gonna be 9,000, most likely. So you realize you're gone, see if you can gently let go and come back. Often in sitting with loving kindness, we use three or four phrases. And you may have your own phrases and that's totally fine. The thing with the phrases is that they just need to be kind of general because you're offering it to yourself, then you're offering it to someone else, then you're offering it to all beings everywhere. So it can't be, you know, may I get a dinner reservation, or, <laughs> you know, may my really nasty coworker get another job, or it's things like, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease is a standard set. You don't have to use them but don't spend this whole time thinking about what you should say. It's better to use them than you can think about it later if you don't have other phrases. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. The feeling tone is not like pleading or imploring. We're not asking someone to make us happy, but it's like, as my friend Sylvia would say, it's like you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a happy birthday. May you have a great new year. May you be safe. May I be safe, right? So it's gift giving, remember? It's offering. That last phrase, may I live with ease or may you live with ease means in the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood, family, may it not be such a struggle. May I live with ease. Okay, we repeat the phrases over and over again. 
with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. I have a friend who said he thought he'd get extra credit for saying more phrases. So you say them really fast to get a lot in, you know, it's like, you don't have to do that. Gather all your attention behind one phrase at a time. If you feel ungrounded, then it's fine to say the phrases along with the breath. Some people really just like having a physical anchor, so they'll coordinate. For some people that's too confusing, in which case just rest your attention in the phrase. Okay? So I'll guide you through it, just one of the many variations. So sit comfortably. Again, you can close your eyes or not. Let your energy settle within your body. See if there are three or four phrases maybe you're accustomed to using or try, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And just repeat these over and over again. Gathering all of your attention behind one phrase at a time.
And see if you can think of a benefactor. A benefactor is someone who's helped you. Maybe they've helped you directly or they've inspired you from afar. This is like somebody who embodies the force of loving kindness for you. The texts say this is the one whom when you think of them you smile. Could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. Who makes you smile? So if someone like that comes to mind, you can bring them here. Get an image of them. Say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Again, even if the words aren't perfect, that's okay. They're carrying the energy of the heart. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And a friend, Let's start with a friend who's doing pretty well right now. They may not be perfectly happy, but at least in some arena of life, they're enjoying success or good fortune. So if someone like that comes to mind, bring them here. You can get an image of them, say their name to yourself, get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them.
and a friend who's not doing so well right now, perhaps they're struggling in some way, bring them here. See what happens as you offer the phrases of loving kindness to them.
And then everybody here, which involves a whole variety of different relationships, those whom we know quite well, those whom we don't know at all, and yourself. Are there even disembodied beings here? Live stream, hello. <laughs> May we be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown, may all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
<laughs> so I want to talk a little bit more about the combo of compassion and equanimity. And then uh, we'll just open it up for questions. Um, <coughs> Because this really is the vital combination for work in the world, trying to make a difference, having a family, you know, like anytime we are interacting in a, a very real way with someone from the space of compassion. So it starts with what um, these days is sometimes used. Uh, to distinguish two states, and that is empathy and compassion. Because, of course, in conventional language, we use those terms interchangeably, but actually they mean somewhat different things. When I gave the definition from the Buddhist psychology, I don't know how you open it further than that. I'm not aware. Um, it really included both in a way. The first part, the trembling or the quivering of the heart is like empathy. So empathy as is used um, these days in research and in psychology, that felt sense of empathy, not just cognitive empathy, which also exists, but that felt sense is like that resonance. Um, it's not meant to be a superimposition, like I know exactly what you're feeling, but it, it is a kind of resonance. It's like we're vibing with somebody like, ooh, likely that's a really uncomfortable state to be in. And some of it, from the point of view of the Buddhist psychology, some of that ability to empathize is born from our own ability to be with our own difficult emotions or states. Because when we can open up to, ooh, this feels really crummy when this person lied to me, for example, and you see someone else in that same situation, it's like you have that kind of resonance, like, oh, that feels really bad when that happens, or something like that, right? So we actually do have a kind of resonance. But what is commonly called compassion fatigue, um, researchers uh, in this particular world are trying to term empathy fatigue instead. Um, so empathy is that resonance, uh, the way Western psychology talks about it is that we might have that resonance with someone who seems to be in trouble or suffering, but we might over-identify, not just thinking, oh, that likely hurts, but like, that could be me. And if I were in that situation, it would be so overwhelming, right? And that means the empathy, which is a good and important, essential quality, becomes what is called um, empathic distress. And again, these aren't states to condemn in ourselves. It's not that they're bad or wrong, but this is draining. This is not onward leading. It's like putting the oxygen mask on someone else and forgetting about yourself. You can't actually go on forever in that way, right? So if your goal is to have a sustained effort sustain compassion, you got to figure out what sustains it, right? And not leave, that doesn't leave you all depleted. So that's the way Western psychology talks about it. Empathy is essential and uh, it's really tremendous watching all these programs coming up to help teach people empathy. I just, because I work so much with people who are either in direct service or who are doing social action of some sort, I feel like I know people with a huge amount of empathy and they need something else, you know? So it's not like going to empathy training is gonna be that productive. So um, 
the way I usually describe it is this. You have that genuine moment of empathy, and that is a necessary but not sufficient condition for compassion to arise, because maybe you genuinely feel into someone's state of distress or suffering, and you're frightened by that, so you want to run away. Or you're exhausted, and you think, I can't bear it. I just can't stay here. Or you're blaming. I gave you perfectly good advice six months ago. If you'd only listened, you wouldn't be in this situation. Or you fall into that strange kind of egoic thing, like, oh, I'm going to fix this in a week and a half. Yeah. Um, or you have the compassionate response. So compassion is just one of many possible responses to that genuine moment of empathy. You need the empathy, but it's not enough. It doesn't ensure that compassion will be the response. So this is the other part of compassion. It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. And implicit in there is the force of equanimity. Otherwise, it would be movement, a movement into, right, to get lost in. And that just doesn't serve anybody in the end. So you go back to everything we've been talking about. Equanimity does not mean coldness. It does not mean indifference. It's a state of perspective. It's a spacious state. It admits what we don't know. We don't have all the answers right now. We can just do the best we can in responding in this moment to this situation. When we're lucky, we do get, by virtue of the Hindsight Meditation Society, we do get some response or we get information we might not have had at the time. So we don't know what the bigger picture has in store, we just know there is a bigger picture, right? So we do the best we can and there needs to be a kind of letting go. Letting go doesn't mean dismissing. It means letting go of control, which we never had, right? So it's coming back into balance with the way things are. So the story I wanted to tell you is, um, it's also in my book, Faith. Um, so uh, it was just a perfect example for me of the Hindsight Meditation Society. So uh, we did bring this Burmese meditation master, Sayada Upandita, to Barry, um, in 1984, that's when he and I went through that whole routine, like, tell me everything you notice when you drink a cup of tea and all that. So uh, he had a really brilliant uh, interpreter that period, and it was three months, so we had a body of talks at the end, and somebody came to me and said, would you uh, help in the creation of a book? Not like write the book, but help that material become a book. So I raised some money and I got a transcriber and we transcribed the talks and I found an editor and I found a publisher and it became a book which is called In This Very Life, The Liberation Teachings of the Buddha by Saito Upandita. So it's wisdom publications and it's a really nice book. It's still in print. Um, it's very clear. Um, it's very, very knowledgeable, of course. And it's very classical. So uh, I looked at it when it was done, and I thought, this is a nice thing. It's like a respectful thing to have done for my teacher. For those people who really appreciate that classical uh, description of practice and, and experience, it'll be really wonderful. It will never be a bestseller. You know, because it's just a certain style of description. So in my mind, I kind of put it in the minor good deed category. So that's the whole first part of the story. The second part of the story was um, Burma uh, has been a military dictatorship for quite a number of years. And the uh, leader of the democracy movement is this woman, Aung San Suu Kyi, who um, until she was released a few years ago, had been under house arrest for like 17 years or something like that, and, um, in and out. And she was really the leader of the democracy movement. So um, it was always known that she could leave, but it was also pretty well known she'd never be allowed back in 
And she always chose not to leave the country because that would mean, you know, a real loss for that movement. And so um, there were a lot of struggles for her at every level in staying, including the fact that her husband, who's British, was raising their two children, their sons, in England. And she, uh, she hardly ever saw them. And, um, and then her husband got sick, and he died without being able to get a visa to go back in and say goodbye. And it was really, you know, it was like a lot of tragedy and sacrifice. And, but when he was still alive, um, and in that 17-year period, she had various times where uh, the government would like ease up and she was allowed to have contact with journalists and Westerners and then they would kind of clamp down again. So in one of those periods of relative freedom, she did an interview with this Japanese newspaper and she said um, that like, you know, many people of every tradition, she decided she wanted to use her time of incarceration as a time of deepening her spiritual life. And for her, being born a Buddhist, as a Burmese person, that meant meditating, but she didn't really know how. So she used to sit at the edge of her bed and like grit her teeth and squeeze her eyes shut and try to force all thoughts out of her mind. So she only got, of course, more stressed out than ever. And then one day her husband, living in England, sent her in a copy of this book in this very life, The Liberation Teachings of the Buddha by Sayada Upandita. And she said she used the book to teach herself how to meditate and that it actually was her greatest source of spiritual strength. So I read that and I quickly took it out of the minor good deed category. <laughs> and I thought this might be the most important thing I've ever done in my life category, <laughs> right? Because it never in a million years would have occurred to me that I could do something that would actually be of significant support for her. You know, and since he's become her teacher, I mean, it's like a whole, a whole thing. And now, of course, I mean, it's a little hard to say because she's sort of running the government, although the Constitution forbids her from actually taking the, the role, but um, it's a different world. So um, I really felt at that time, I mean, there's no way I ever could have imagined that action wouldn't have that result. And so I decided at the time, I haven't done it yet, but I decided someday I was gonna write a book called Basically Clueless. Because <laughs> I figured, we're just basically clueless, you know. It's all run by the Hindsight Meditation Society. <laughs> if you're lucky, you find out what the effects were of this thing you did. All you can do is act in the best way you can, from the best motive you can. And we just don't know. So that's the role of equanimity. You don't stop, you actually get the strength to go on when you're not all tied up and it's gotta work. It's gotta work right tomorrow. It's working exactly this way because we just don't know. So again, it's not like just trying to feel better and you're not avoiding the truth. That is the truth. And so wisdom is expressed through balance, through equanimity, it's some perspective, admitting what we don't know, being able to let go finding integrity not in the immediate reaction of somebody, but in looking back at our motive, looking at whether we really were as skillful as we might have been. And that's it, you know, they really go together. They're very intertwined and, and that's very real. It's not just theoretical. It's every time we take an action or we say something born out of compassion it really needs that kind of balance along with it. And we can cultivate that. That's, that's you know, a big part of this practice. Okay, so I'm opening it up to you if you have, whoa. <laughs> Thank you for moving around with the microphone. Yeah, I'm going to use your word resonate because that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, I have a good handle on the awareness part and being aware of some of the thoughts and feelings that come into my mind. Um, 
but this was the piece that really made it click for me. Um, without going into much detail, and I'm sure we've all experienced similar things, but kind of witnessing relationships like on a train wreck or just things going really wrong and you feel um, that you can have some impact and influence on changing the course of, of what could happen. And with me, um, I do have a lot of empathy to situation and I always want to help. And it's consuming. Um, it could be really taxing. And it's almost as if I respond, um, it becomes a heightened state. Because it's almost as if I don't become incredibly stressed by it. I interpret it as a way that I haven't done enough. Like if I just sit back and have that more calmness, it means to me I feel like I, I should be doing more. Um, but now I'm beginning to understand that it doesn't have to escalate to that um, and, and to understand that, that sense of control, that I can't control that outcome. So it almost strikes me that that's an immature mindset to have, that you can have control when in fact, right, you can't. So, you know, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, it is immature in a certain sense, but we all have it. You know, I think it's, it's just highly conditioned. Yeah. Um, and the best thing is not just kind of sitting back and being calm and self-satisfied in some way, but it's acting with that, in that context of calm, you know, or space. It's just having some space even as we're, we're taking the action. Because I think, honestly, um, if we were the recipient of someone's action, that's what we would want. So the example is used, I use this example in this context a lot. It actually originally comes from a meditation instruction in uh, Tibetan Buddhist teaching. So the meditation instruction is look at the thoughts and feelings that come up in your mind as though you were quite an elderly person sitting in a playground watching children play. Look at the thoughts and feelings that come up in your mind as though you were quite an elderly person sitting in a playground watching children play. So what does that mean in this context? Let's say you're quite an elderly person. It means you've seen a lot. You've lived a life, you've seen a lot of change, you've probably had to let go of a lot. And you see this little kid completely freaking out because they break a shovel. <laughs> you know, you're not all cold and mean. You don't go up to them and say, hey kid, it's just a shovel, you know? <laughs> Wait till you have a real problem. Like, you know, you're tender, you're caring, you're present, and you also don't fall down on the ground sobbing like them, because you know what? Shovels break. That's a part of life. It's both, you know? It's like the presence, the caring, and there's some perspective. That's wisdom, and I feel like I, as a person, as an individual, if I was seeking help from somebody, and I told them my very sad story, and they fell down on the ground sobbing, I'd completely lose it. It would be terrifying for me. Like, ooh, there's nothing beyond this, just as I suspected. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't want them to be all cold and mean, like, ah, that's just a shovel. But I do want both, and it doesn't even have to be verbal. You know, it's a knowing that people exhibit, like, yes, there's a bigger space, and wow, that must really hurt, right? And I think we do tend to want both. And, Otherwise, we're like taking care of the care provider, right? Um, and not only do we want both, we can have both. Not perfectly, not all the time, uh, but that's the work. That's the process, you know, that we're, we're working with and toward. Hi, Sharon. Hi. <laughs> This is a two-porter. 
as my practice in as my meta practice strengthens, I also well I have compassion for myself, I also find I have enormous waves of remorse. And I don't always know where to put that because it can be very profound. Little second question is, um, this is sort of a cocktail, a meditation cocktail question because I have the meta practice every day and I also have my breathing and I and many days I just combine it I go from one into the other but I've talked to some longtime meditators who say oh we really should do them at separate times and I don't I I I'm not sure that that raised some questions about how to fit Mm -hmm. You know, one in the morning, one at night. Right, right. <laughs> well, since I'm the ultimate authority. <laughs> you are. In my circle, you are. <laughs> okay, in terms of the first, um, there's a distinction that is sometimes made in the Buddhist psychology between remorse and guilt. So, it's very natural as we go deeper to feel times of remorse. Um, it's kind of part of the purification in a way. And uh, we do get more sensitive, we get more aware, and those times we've kind of broken the harmony, we've said something hurtful or whatever, they do tend to come back. And we feel the pain of that because it's very genuine and we need to, in effect, forgive ourselves and kind of like lessons learned that kind of thing really has a residue, it really hurts, and we move on. So it's kind of part of beginning again. Um, that way, as painful as it is, it's useful. Guilt, on the other hand, is kind of like, is defined as being more stuck there. You know, it's, we can't just kind of realize that pain, let go and move on. We just go over it and over it and over it and over it. So that's not, skillful or useful because it leaves us exhausted. Um, so when you feel the remorse or you're experiencing the memory or whatever it is, you can remind yourself, this is good, this is a learning, I'm gonna let go, have some meta for yourself and move on because the condition tendency we have might be to just stay there and spin around and um, it's very practical in a way. It's like even kind of an ethical basis or a moral basis. It's like, what's the problem with guilt? It's not like creepy or, you know, doesn't mean we're a terrible person. It's just, it's exhausting. You know, it's not useful for us. It's not gonna help us move on and grow and change and learn. So. Therefore, we don't want to cultivate it. Well, it's, it's also hurtful. exhausting for others. If yes, that's true too. <laughs> it can be really exhausting for others. Um, but it will happen. You know, the remorse part will happen. It just comes up. When I was working with Sayadu Pandita that year in 1984, so um, I think I said this already, we invited him to teach and I'd never met him before. So. He arrived one day and we started sitting under his guidance for in the next day. So he also turned out to be um, a very tough teacher, you know, strong, insistent, demanding, fierce. And uh, we had a great relationship, but not everybody did. <laughs> and it was just a style, you know, it was like a stylistic thing and it really worked for me. So, uh, but still, so, I went through a period in my practice where just all these memories were coming back of things I had done or things that I had said that didn't seem that good and it was painful to recollect and I didn't really want to tell him but remember we're seeing him six days a week you know so you finally have to tell him what's going on even if you don't want to so um, I told him and first he got really excited and he said is it going all the way back to childhood? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, no. 
you know, and then he said, you have to sort of understand him, he was sort of, he's a big tease, you know. He said, um, well, I guess you're finally seeing the truth about yourself. And this huge protest rose up in me, like, no, I'm not. And he just laughed, you know, because that's what he'd been looking for, is my not being totally identified with all of that stuff, right? So that was just his way of bringing me to that place of saying, no, I'm not. You know, I'm not just that. Um, but that's the point, you know, it is painful, it is gonna come up, it's a good process, and you don't wanna just identify with that, like I'm the worst person that ever lived, right? Okay, so in terms of how you divide your sitting, it's up to you, and a lot of it has to do with the way your own mind works. <coughs> it's fine if you wanna sit sometimes doing loving kindness and sometimes doing mindfulness, if those are your two practices, it can be really useful. Some people do divide it in one sitting. Um, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Again, you know, I'm the kind of person who tends to rely on structure, so what I would be tempted to do, which doesn't really work, <coughs> it's like as soon as I learn more than one technique, <coughs> I would start and then a minute and a half later, I'd say, this isn't working. Let me do the other. And I do that for like 90 seconds. And I'd say, no, I'm going back. And then I'd say, oh, this is boring. I'm going back to the other one, you know. So for me, even if I'm doing two practices in one session, it's good to have a, a divide. So some people start with a little loving kind, I mean, it doesn't have to be absolute, and also you don't have to feel imprisoned by that, you know, if it seems important to switch, you just switch. But some people will start with some minutes of loving kindness and then move to just mindfulness, because it helps create a kind of warmer, nicer atmosphere. Uh, many people will end with loving kindness um, after however long of mindfulness that they do, because it's, uh, like a bridge to life and other people. And um, these days as I practice, and I do practice every day, which I really urge you to do, my formal sitting is, these days is virtually all mindfulness practice. But I have this resolve to do loving kindness practice whenever I'm waiting and I count every mode of transportation as waiting. So walking down the street, sitting on an airplane, sitting in a taxi, or literally waiting if I'm waiting um, in a store, I'm waiting at Penn Station or whatever it is. Um, rather than doing something I'm not really interested in doing, like reading something I don't care about, I do loving kindness practice. So you can do it walking down the street silently. Um, <laughs> You might need to change the way you do it in that there's a walking practice in loving kindness uh, where you rest your attention on the silent repetition of the phrases. I usually do it so that the phrases are, the baseline of the phrases is for myself. So I'm walk, and also the f three or four phrases might be too many while you're walking. So I usually shorten it so it's like, may I be happy, be peaceful, be happy, be peaceful. I should say eyes open also. Um, <laughs> and then when someone comes by, you know, I hear a dog or I see a person, I just briefly like, oh, be happy. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to the phrases for myself. So it's a really nice way of walking down the streets of New York. Um, and as I, I often say, one of the things that amuses me about it, that I like about it, is that all the same judgments may arise, but you kind of cap it with a little loving kindness, like, this is the wrong jacket for this season, I'll be happy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's a difference than how we normally are. So, yeah, there are lots of options. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, um, I have two quick questions. The first one is, 
I feel like I've heard uh, the four qualities in the same order every time a different teacher brings them up. Is there a meaning behind that as far as the order of presentation? Uh, yes and no, because there are Tibetan schools that actually begin with equanimity. Uh -huh. um, because it's sort of like the ground out of, it's, out, it's equanimity that allows each of the other three to be there. I mean, the standard way of saying that would be the, their pure form, mm -hmm. you know, rather than some distortion. Um, but uh, I certainly have heard this way, because, you know, I'm not really from that school, um, over and over and over again. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I suspect it's because meta is like the vehicle and the others play into that if you're choosing to do it through one vehicle. Okay, and the second one was... Do you have prominent, living, well-known examples uh, of those that operate from a high level on the equanimous scale. Just for us to keep in mind, uh, this is obviously your own identification of who you see in the world right now. You know, the Gandhis, the MLK, those people have gone. But as far as how you, through your own lens, you see people who are, you know, maybe have mastered equanimity or are on the way of mastering equanimity? Um, I don't know about mastering, but... Um I think both of well-known people like Aung San Suu Kyi or the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh, it's basically people who have really suffered a lot and yet are effective, are caring, are seeing many sides of an issue. Um, and it's very ordinary people. It's a lot of mothers and fathers, you know, and, and people who are, I mean, there are plenty of stories in this room, I'm sure. Um, any of us that need to let go on a continual basis. Um, you know, people dealing with someone else's illness, or uh, I think we see it all the time, and, and uh, we need it. You know, the world needs, needs a lot more of it in the sense that we need a lot more wisdom, we need a lot more perspective. And, um, I think, you know, since you said Gandhi or Martin Luther King, it's like there are many people engaged in social movements these days um, who are doing that from a different place. I think Ai Jen Poo, she's a great example. Ai Jen Poo? Ai Jen Poo? A-I-J-E-N-P-O-O, um, who's a labor organizer organizing like domestic workers and home health care workers. And if you read her book, um, you know, uh, she talks a lot about love as the organizing principle, because the people she is organizing are the people who are caring for the people we love, right? Uh, and so, um, and yet, that is one frustrating world to try to make a difference in, and you need like such huge perspective. Um, so I would say, yeah, I, you know, I think there are. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned when you were in Russia the translation was for compassion was this kind of overwhelming uh, feeling. Um, so I tend to study neuroscience and my research is on um, perpetual victimhood mentality that some nations have. Can you hear me? No? no. Okay, so that. perpetual victimhood mentality um, and that combined with self-compassion. I'm curious about people who break down about their own suffering and kind of dwell in their own suffering. Um, and where's, you know, where, what's their line where self-compassion is helpful and where it's, you cross the line and you become a victim of, of the circumstance and you dwell upon that? Well, I don't think self-compassion leads to that. I think something else leads to that. You know, I don't, so I don't think there's a line. Um, I think self-compassion is its own, um, distinct force. So it's the way, um, the main researcher in, in uh, the distinction between empathy and compassion is Tanya Singer. And 
So we may use those words synonymously, but I mean, she says they're different regions of the brain. When we're experiencing, I don't think they heard. can you hear that? You didn't hear the question? Okay. Okay, so the question was about self-compassion leading to a sense of like victimhood. Um, and so I was saying, as you heard, uh, I don't think that's a progression, you know? I don't think there's a line between having self-compassion and falling into victimhood. I think they're two different responses. And so in the same way that Tanya Singer would make that distinction between empathy and compassion, based on her neuroscience, um, I mean, self-compassion is its own thing. I think the research is just really coming out, right? So um, you'll have to help me the three, because there is now a whole school of psychology which is talking about self-compassion, and there are three constituent elements to it. One is uh, mindfulness, it's like knowing what you feel, let's say you make a big mistake or something like that. And so it's, it's being able to recognize the feeling. One is kindness toward yourself. And one is this sense of um, common humanity. Like it's recognizing this is not just me. People make mistakes. This is a terrible feeling. I want to do what I can do not to fall into this again. but. Um, this is part of the human experience because some of what maybe is the victimhood thing is actually a sense of specialness, right? And uh, it can, that special thing can translate in lots of ways, including I'm the worst person that ever lived. Um, you know, so I, I just don't see it as like a link in that way. Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear can me? Can you hear her? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so my question is about the O Farmer story that you told earlier, which is, um, you know, when someone's offering you a gift of hostility or aggression, that you don't have to accept it. Um, which I think is, um, to me, I guess it means you don't have to internalize it. Um, and so I guess. When I think about that, and I think about um, how you describe compassion as being a movement towards, in a way to offer help, can you speak about how you do both of those things at the same time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the movement toward is internal, in the sense that you care, right? Um, you are moving toward, um, instead of shrinking back in fear or striking out in anger. So you're moving toward what you perceive as suffering. But again, it's like a question of balance. It's, it's not gonna be at all effective to just pull it in. So um, one of the ways we talk about equanimity is space, it's spaciousness, but that doesn't mean iciness, right? So you have that kind of caring. Well, it's like the, the example of the elderly person. You have that kind of caring uh, expressed however seems right in that situation, but it's in the context of a bigger space, which might mean I'm not responsible for your happiness actually. You know, I'm sorry to see how difficult this is for you, but inside you know, it's not up to me to make it up to you, you know, to make it all okay. Or I will do everything I can and that may well be not enough. Um, you know, so we really, we need that, it's like a context within which we act and it might be that your best guess of the most appropriate action, not the state of compassion, but the action is going away. Um, the development of a state like loving kindness or compassion is about motivation. It's not about action in the sense that 
there is no like singular compassionate action. So, uh, I mean, I sort of implied all this earlier, but to be more explicit, um, again, from the uh, sort of context of Buddhist teaching, you can say there are three parts to an action. One is the motivation. That's the intention behind the action. So I might pick this up and hand it to you. And all anybody sees is my hand moving down, picking up an object and moving it forward. And only I can know really the motivation. I mean, sometimes we feel we're sensitive or we can guess, but really only we can know our own motivation. So maybe I'm offering it to you because I like you and I want you to have it. Or maybe I'm offering it to you because I see that water bottle. And I say, well, hey, maybe I'll give you the bell and you'll give me the water bottle. <laughs> or maybe I'm giving it to you because I don't like you. And I'm not going to give you the cushion with it, you know? But it's like, <laughs> you're really going to sound bad, but, and you're not going to know why. Um, you know, but it's the same gesture. It's even the same smile, but it's coming from a totally different place, okay? So in the West, we don't usually consider the motivation. Uh, we sort of mock it, you know, like the road to hell is paved with good intentions, or what do you mean you had a good motive, you completely screwed up? But in uh, Buddhist teaching, that is a very important part of the action. So the second part is the skillfulness or the unskillfulness of the execution. So that is like mindfulness in the bigger picture. That's mindfulness of context. Where am I right now? It's what I called my best guess of the most appropriate skillful way to do something or say something in this context, in this moment in time. So I might have a beautiful motive for giving you the bell. I might stop and think, you know what? I've only got one bell. Maybe I should do this privately. Or I don't own the bell, that's actually stealing. You know, maybe I should go pay for it before I give it to you. Or maybe I should give you lessons on how to melodiously ring a bell. Or, you know, all kinds of other possibilities. And we're not perfect, and we make mistakes, and hopefully we learn from our mistakes, but we can also learn certain skills. It's like if you're supervising people, um, you figure out, you know, it's not that useful to say to someone you're an idiot, right? <laughs> First of all, it doesn't give them the information they need if they want to make a change. It's much better to be more specific, like, and it's much better, even though it's, a little, you know, also cliched, to use eye language, like, when the memo was six weeks late, I couldn't go on vacation, and I was really frustrated, right? That's inarguable. No one can say you're wrong about what you're feeling or what happened. That also gives someone the information they need if they want to make a change, right? So there's skills of communication we learn. Those two things, the motivation and the skillful execution, are not the same thing, right? They're very related, but they're actually two different parts of an action. And this is the place where if we conflate them and we think they're one thing, that's the place where people freak out. And they say, were I to be more loving, I could only say yes. I can only give you more money. I could only be sweet. I can only let you keep living with me. I could only, whatever, and that's not true. This is where tough love comes from, right? You can be having a genuine, compassionate motivation and your best guess in a certain context, in a certain moment in time, is that the most skillful thing you can do is say no. Have a boundary. Say, I'm not giving you any money, or whatever, right? So they're not inextricably tied together. That's why the development of loving kindness, it, it is not gonna determine what we do, it's gonna transform why we do things. So if in general we've been coming from a place of fear in what we do or what we say and we strengthen that 
uh, quality, we will be coming more and more from a place of connection in what we do or what we say. But our lives don't get smaller. You know, they actually get bigger. There are many possibilities for how we respond. And then just to finish the model, the third aspect of an action is the immediate result. So that's like the praise and blame. You give someone a bell and, and they say, it's the most stupid thing I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> that's a moment, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Certainly we would have preferred a different reaction, but we also remember, you know what? Maybe they had dreadful news or, you know, they're coming from their own experience or there's always blame in this world or whatever it is. So we try to have some equanimity around, and also it's the immediate part. Remember what we see in front of us isn't necessarily the end of the story. So we have to sort of bow to the hindsight meditation society here too. <laughs> There's a question from online. This is from Tamara. Um, she said, I do compassion meditation and find my heart is much warmer. I care for more people now. My sister-in-law is passing of cancer and I can't control my heartache when she expresses suffering and I feel that I do more harm than good to my sen because, of my because of my sensitivity. How do I keep compassion and equi equanimity? Is there an equanimity practice and meditation one can do similar to the loving kindness meditation, something that will help build more equanimity? Um, yes, <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, these are very, very difficult situations. I think it's also um, the development of equanimity that allows us to hang in there, because it's not easy even to bear witness when we feel we can't fix it, when the truth is we can't fix it. It's not easy at all. And yet that person um, is more or less abandoned if everybody just can't handle it, right? So um, there are different ways we build equanimity. One is uh, you also have to be realistic, right? And there may be times, doesn't have to be lengthy periods of time, but there are times when you just have to nurture yourself. You have to think about compassion for yourself. You need a break. Um, and remember that that's like putting the oxygen mask on yourself so you can then help somebody else. So you might figure out there's a certain rhythm to that as well. And there is an equanimity practice um, the way because so many people don't like the word karma or misunderstand the word karma, often people will use a phrase like, things are as they are. Or, I care about your pain and I can't control it. I actually wrote, um, I wrote two meditations and they're in a few of my books. I think one uh, version of it is in Real Happiness at Work. Um, one meditation is for th those who are themselves suffering or dying, and the other is for the caregiver. Um, and it's just a kind of a loving kindness practice. I care about you and it's not in my hands in the end. You know, and, and so um, there are more poetic ways of saying it than that, but, but that's, that's basically it. And I think it really does give us a kind of strength to be able to hang in there um, over a much longer period of time. Hello. Um, I just want to preface my question by saying that um, you and your cohorts, your posse, have brought um, such a profound uh, gift to the West. And um, my, uh, my initial understanding, my initial inspiration came from Ram Dass when I was in college, when I was like 17 or something, many, many years ago. 
Um, but in 1994 or 5, I was reading a, a review of Mark Epstein's book, Thoughts Without a Thinker, and I was going through a particularly uh, challenging patch in my life, and I wrote him a letter to ask him um, if he could recommend a meditation teacher uh, in, in the Boston area, a private one, of course. And, <laughs> and I put a self-addressed stamp postcard in the letter. So he wrote me back, and he gave me Larry Rosenberg's name and told me to go to the Insight Meditation Center and lose the, uh, the idea that I needed anybody private. <clears throat> um, and honestly, I have to tell you that, you know, it's changed the course of my life. That's almost 30 years ago now. It's changed the course of my life. It's changed the course of my children's lives. It's changed everything. Mm -hmm. And I am deeply grateful to you um, and to Jack and to, you know, absolute Joseph and everyone. Um, it's really massive. So my question, my curiosity is really around what this has been like for you, what this journey has been like for you to have it, you know, unfold in such a massive, powerful way. Thank you. Thank you for what you said. Um, Um, it's, thank you, <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Um, you know, when we started, like when we opened up the center, it was like a big deal, like, can we do this? Like, the place, well, now we've, you know, built and stuff like that, it has 97 single rooms for, everyone has a single room, uh, that you don't get your own bathroom when you come <laughs> to sit. You know, but it, it probably held 90 or 100 people in some combinations of rooms. And we just stood there looking at that building thinking, will there ever come a time when we'll fill it? And we thought, probably not. But if we can get 30 people, you know, at a, at a shot, that would be like an amazing thing. And. Uh, it's sort of unbelievable. I mean, I was just in Miami. Um, I arrived on a Thursday. Uh, Friday morning, I taught at the law school at the University of Miami because it's a mindfulness and law program. <laughs> Friday afternoon, I taught at a synagogue because they were starting a Jewish spirituality based on mindfulness program. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, I taught through the auspices of the university, just a, a completely open event, and um, met all kinds of people. And Amishi, my friend there, the neuroscientist that I was staying with, she has a lab at the University of Miami. She's studying meditation. They have taught the football team. They've taught an accounting firm. They, she does a lot of work with the military. She's worked with military spouses and children. It's like. It just goes on and on and on. Or you look at England, which is really, you know, like we have Tim Ryan, who's a congressman from Ohio, who's a big meditator and mindfulness advocate and openly. And I mean, he's written a book about it called Mindful Nation. And, but they've got like half a parliament sitting, <laughs> you know, literally and really sitting. And um, the government uh, just issued a mindfulness report urging, is it the National Health Service, NHS, is that what it is? Urging people, you know, get mindfulness training for mental illness or for this or for that. Or, and it's, it's sort of, I can't believe it actually. Sometimes it feels like a joke. Um, and of course, there's a whole range of what's being taught. So, uh, you know, that, that's a pretty big range. But um, even just hearing the word mindfulness, I was like, really? Uh, so it's, it's kind of amazing, and from one point of view, 40 years is a long time, and from another point of view, it's nothing. So um, I don't know what happened. Like I, I, I saw John Kabat-Zinn somewhere, and I said, what do you think happened? I mean, it can't just be the science and the research. 
And he said, I think it's the science and the research. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. The downturn. The what? I think the economic downturn. Oh, the economic downturn. Yes. Well, I think that was significant. A lot of things were significant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have five minutes. No, we have five minutes. Um, that's a great ringtone, though. I will. I will <laughs> say. I, I need someone to have the microphone. Hi. Um, the. The retreat that you're doing at Garrison, going back to the question from the, the online question about developing capacity for helping others when they're suffering without falling apart yourself, will you do a lot of practice on that at that retreat? Yes, I think we will do quite a lot of practice at the Garrison retreat um, on just that point. Like, uh, of course, I have three co-teachers, you know, um, who are incredible people, and uh, their experience is really in the inner city schools of Baltimore. And so um, they've worked a lot with despair and helplessness and, and those situations. So uh, I think it will be a very powerful experience. Yeah, I really uh, encourage people if you're free in early March. It's so close to New York City, Garrison, that it, it would be a very interesting experience. Oh, yeah. um, my, uh, so in 95, I came back to, uh, I had been living in Kenya and came back to the States and I was seen an acupuncturist. Can you hear him? No. Still hear. not? Mm -hmm. um, Okay, is that better? Yeah, there we go. And, um, and so my acup I think I told you this before, but um, recommended for me to come to go to Insight in Barrie. And, um, and what he said, this is what came to me, he said, it's the real deal. Those are the real teachers, and it's the real deal. And um, that's, that crossed my mind because of the last time I sat with you and you said, what do you think about this title? Real, Real Love is the new book. And I, that just struck me. It's like, no, it's perfect. You're the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And on that note, we actually have to stop. <laughs> so thank you all. It's been a great Saturday. Thank you. video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Thanks for watching. Tashi Delek.